This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. Let's take it straight away to our good friends at Legally Kidnap for this update. Hello, I'm a child protective worker. I work for the product acquisition team of the child protective industry. We got a report from an anonymous caller saying that you abused or neglected your child. I have been sent here to investigate. You have the right to cooperate. Resistance is futile. You have no other choice but to let me do my job. You must answer all of my questions and tell me everything I want to hear. If you refuse, I'll go right down to the courthouse and have the judge sign a removal order, which I'll probably do anyway. It's better to be safe than sorry, you know. You will be required to sign forms giving me permission to conduct my investigation including talking to your doctors, your kids' teachers, and daycare providers, or anyone else who has any information about you or your family. You will also sign a form giving me permission to go to your kids' school and talk to them without any parental interference. I can show up at any time without any prior notice, and I can take your kid away from you without a shred of evidence of any parental wrongdoing. You are completely at my mercy, and I already don't like you. I can take your children away and make it so you can never see them again. What do you think about that? I will not be held accountable for any wrongdoing no matter how bad I screw up because I am immune from prosecution and the judge will simply rubber stamp his signature on any piece of paper I put in front of him so you really don't stand much of a chance. So where should we begin? Why don't you tell me everything that I want to hear while I go looking around your house for any safety issues that I can think up. I think you're a terrible parent. You beat your kid, don't you? No, you say? Well, I don't believe you. I'm going to take your kid away and throw them into a foster home. Then I'm going to require you to undertake a series of tasks including drug screenings, psychological evaluations, and parenting classes. These service providers will all help me to build my case against you, and no matter how hard you try, it will never be enough. I'll just simply find something else to use against you, and keep adding it on. Well, I guess that's enough for today. See you soon. CPS took me away, in my best interest they say, they took me to a strange place, and said that I'll be safe here, and then they bounced me around, another home, a new town, put all my stuff in garbage bags, and say I have to move there, I just wanna go home, CPS just keeps saying no, say they'll give me visitation, for some reason it never happens, my social work, she lies, she's crazy, and she won't let me see my mommy, my foster mother, is so mean to me, cause she won't let me call my mommy, my foster father, he tried to me, and they won't let me tell my daddy, and all the other kids, they even tease me, cause I just want to call my mommy. Said I have ADHD And now I'm worth more money Because I'm special needs They put me in a group home There's not enough foster homes Can't find a forever home No one wants to adopt me I just wanna go home The lawyers and the judges say no And even though nothing happened The workers TPR'd my parents My social worker 
listen to me If she won't let me see my mommy My casa worker is a stooge for the agency If she won't let me call my mommy My foster brother, he one time beat me And they won't let me tell my daddy And all the other kids are great big bullies And I just want to call my mommy since they took me away I miss her so bad I miss her so bad It makes me so, so mad Before they took me away It wasn't so bad And you should know that This makes me so, so sad Even though the worker lied Before they snatched me She still won't let me Call oh, my mommy, my social worker She lies, she's crazy And she won't let me see my mommy And all the other kids They beat and tease me Cause I just want to call my mommy Before they took me away It wasn't so bad It makes me so mad It makes me so, so sad Before they took me away It wasn't so bad so let me call my mommy Thank you Legally Kidnap We're going to go now to a video clip from Adina Carl from Lansing, Michigan and she's going to tell how corrupt the family court was in her case where she was not able to submit any evidence. Let's go to that clip. Hi, my name's Adina. I'm 35. I live in Lansing, Michigan, county of Ingham in Michigan. Um, my oldest is going to be there, or nope, she just turned 13. Her name is Aubrey Ann Tucker. I have um, a son named Dayton Thomas Tucker who just turned 12. And my youngest turned eight in July at the end. Her name is Bracey Jean Carl. Um, my case starts in 2010, around May, when my parents had a power of attorney over my child because they had pretty much harassed me with CPS until CPS said that they had had too many complaints and they needed to open a case. To not have to deal with the foster care system and with CPS, I had turned a power of attorney of my kids over to my parents. Um, at the end of the power of attorney, about two weeks before the power of attorney were supposed to end, my parents took my youngest child, Bracey, into the ER. Um, in 2010, she would have been five years old, um, approximately four and a half, she wasn't quite five yet. And she repeated a story of molestation and personally stated my boyfriend at the time, his name, to the ER attending Finn Decision. So they did a Dr. Gertens report and put my child immediately into the foster care system. Um, it was a mess. I had no family support system because my family was the one that directly helped place my child in the foster care system and this is where my child was placed at and my two oldest children were already with their father so thank goodness they never became a part of the foster care network however their father was not much better um, my first day of court was probably the worst I had an attorney that was my court appointed attorney trying to force me to take a plea and telling me I had no choice, otherwise my kids were all going to become wards of the court. Um, I called my mom, my biological mom, who lived in Oregon at the time, and it was early in the morning there, it was probably 7 o'clock, and when she called me back I was bawling, telling her that the attorney was trying to force me to take a plea to these sexual molestation charges in family court and I refused because I knew they weren't true. Um, throughout the entire 19 months I dealt with foster care, throughout the different many times in court, 
I was denied access to my child, um, unsupervised visitation with my child based around a molestation accusation that at the end of, right before they terminated my rights, it ended up being stricken from the record. They were unable to provide enough evidence. However, every time we were in court, you had a prosecuting attorney in family court stating that my boyfriend or ex-boyfriend was very much a suspect and on the police radar and they were looking for more evidence and they were going to press charges and all these good things, but none of it was true. Um, when I had talked to the detective that investigated the matter myself, she in fact told me that she didn't give him a polygraph test because she didn't feel one was necessary because she did not feel that he had done anything wrong. I was sent to do a DHS like psyche veil with a state psychologist and the state psychologist had determined on her own that she had some concerns with my overall mental health and ability to provide care for my children. Um, she stated that there was some evidence of a cognitive impairment based on the fact that I only had a ninth grade reading level and the fact that I reported graduating from high school and taking college classes. Adina reported using marijuana daily since age 14 with current use but neglected to report my use of ecstasy which was alleged in agency documents. Once again it was an allegation that was made by an agency or by who the agency was talking to which was my abusive stepmother or my abusive father or my abusive ex-husband and his then wife who is now his ex-wife. Um, they made, she made it seem like I exaggerated the part about taking college classes, which really disturbs me because this is something that could have been proven. In, in the family court system, they don't take a burden of proof. A judge never asked for Dr. Gerton's report. A judge never asked to see my, my transcripts from high school to see if there was evidence that I had a cognitive impairment when I was attending high school classes which if they would have checked, they would have found out I was an above average student. I was exceptionally above average. The worst thing that I had going for me was the fact that I had the lack of a healthy support system. And I also had the lack of a healthy lifestyle outside my house. While my kids did not see or were a part, nor, nor were they a part of what I did outside of my household, I have now realized that what I did outside of my household still directly affected them even if they didn't know. I have had to make significant lifestyle changes. However, when my rights were terminated, my rights were terminated under the thoughts that I, the, the judge stated, because of my mental health diagnosis, my mental instability, and my spotty record taking meds. She also cited that I did not have, impro that I had improper housing, which was not true. I had my own two bedroom house for eight months of the 19 months that my daughter was in foster care. Um, I had completed one parenting class, was going to another parenting class. I had been volunteering at a local organization called Justice Mental Health, Justice and Mental Health Organization, also known as the Jim Ho Drop-In Center in Lansing, Michigan, which three weeks after my termination of rights trial, I was hired as a peer support specialist. Um, I, I, I'm looking to share my story. I don't want to see this continue to happen in Michigan. I don't want to see this continually harm our children. My child was forced to go to therapy based around a sexual, allega a sexual molestation allegation that never happened. She went to play therapy where she played and then a therapist interpreted how she played, never asking her why or what. She'd watch my daughter get an Etch-a-Sketch and black out the board with a triangle and then it was the triangle was mad and then this triangle turned into my daughter and my daughter was angry because I had her in this situation but again this conclusion was drawn off from pure speculation or what she had heard. It wasn't based around actually talking to my daughter and trying to get a, 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 a an exact answer from my daughter. She just let her play and then interpreted. Um, you could have never convinced me and in all everything that I know of our court system that there was a court system like this. 
where there is not a burden of the proof, where getting an attorney to help stand up for you and defend you in this court will cost you a retainer fee, something similar to that of the defense of a murder victim. How is it easier to take my kids away from me than it is to throw a man who committed murder into prison? How is that so much easier? So I'm going to touch more on the psyche veil because this is the big, the biggest thing that they sent me to. Um, in fact, I was told that I'm not even supposed to have this psyche veil which is even more disturbing to me. How don't you get the evidence that is being presented against you? How don't you get to face your accusers? I was sent to, um, the, the purpose of my evaluation was to assess my ability to parent my child based on my emotional stability and overall mental health. I myself acknowledge that the following report will be released to DHS for use in court proceedings and case planning. She described me as a 32-year-old Caucasian female. My height was 5'4", and I was overweight. I wore jeans, a Mickey Mouse t-shirt, and a teal hooded sweatshirt and tennis shoes. I have blue eyes and a poor complexion. My long brown hair was pulled back into a ponytail. My nails were short and plain. I wore no jewelry and no makeup. I have a tattoo on my left hand of Tinkerbell and on her wrist of spoiled rotten a large tattoo on my upper arm of a part-time angel, and I shared that I had other tattoos that I did not show. My overall hygiene was good. What did this have to do with it at all, any of my effectiveness to be a mother? I went through my life story, recounting my own physical abuse and mental abuse that I went through in the, my dad and stepmom's home from a very tender age of about the first grade, my first grade year through 15 when I was out in the streets on my own. Um, my parents claimed I was a runaway and I claimed I was kicked out. <laughs> I was forced out of my home. Um, I had an abusive stepmother and this is where they placed my child for pretty much the entire time that she was in foster care. Even though every one of our permanency planning conferences dealt with not putting my child back in my care, but the problems and issues pertaining to the house where she had her, which happened to be my dad and stepmom. Everything from one trimester of her kindergarten year, she missed 16 days of school in one trimester. She was sent home three times with head lice and she was sent home once with ringworm. I don't even need to pull out a piece of paper to tell you the things that were going wrong with my child because I remember them if I don't remember anything else throughout this whole thing because my entire time all I wanted to do was rescue my child from the home she was in. There was another visit where they found animal feces on the floor that had been there for an, an extra a long amount of time. It seemed to be dry and hard. Um, they found pornographic material in a bathroom that my daughter frequent and yet they were alleging molestation happened in my household, yet my child lived in their household. Um, a gun on the table or a bullet on the table, spoiled food on a counter, piled up dirty laundry. Um, there was one time that there was a PPC meeting and basically the adoption lady told my parents there was no way, this was one of our first permanency planning conferences and it was based around whether or not my parents were going to be able to adopt my child or not. It had very little to do with my reunification process. They say that I withheld information from them and I did because I felt like the more that they knew, the more they were going to be out to get me. They already didn't want me to have my child. They already didn't want me to touch her. They didn't want me to see her. They didn't want me nowhere around her. And I highly feel like if they would have had the opportunity to terminate my rights as soon as they heard the allegation, they would have. The psyche veil, however, since it was about my ability to parent, my parental index, her, my, the parenting index results were favorable and did not highlight any specific concerns. It was all about my mental health. And yes, I do tend to be a little bipolar and my mind starts to race. 
but I've never ever been a threat to my children. I might have been a threat to anyone that would have ever threatened to harm my children, but never would I have ever harmed my children. I would have never done anything to take from them, to hurt them, to punish them. I would have never done anything to myself if I would have thought that it would have hurt them. If I would have known my lifestyle and the way I lived outside of my household and while I was away from my children would have at all affected my children, I would have changed, and I did. Um, August of 2003, or no, August 3rd of 2011, I was saved while I was in the Clinton County Jail. Shortly thereafter, I was released, and it wasn't until February 3rd of 2012 when my child was taken. Shortly after getting out of Clinton County Jail, I moved into a house that is ran by, that, that's not ran by, but the landlord is my mother's high school sweetheart. And they've remained good friends, and he had an empty house in Lansing, and I needed a house. So he helped me out. The prosecution made the allegation that this was my sugar daddy, and that's how I got my house. They made the allegation of the sexual molestation with no proof to back it up. They made the allegation that I didn't have appropriate housing, which I had obtained adequate housing. They made all kinds of allegations. They made all kinds of statements in court, and I've got every single one of my transcripts that were not true. And if anybody would have talked to anybody and properly investigated all allegations, including the ones I was making against my dad and my stepmom and my ex-husband at the time, then they would have found that what I was saying was very much true, no matter how many mistakes I had made in my lifestyle or in my lifetime, which Quite honestly, if I was out on my own from 15 and I'm only now 35 and when I was going through this by their own reports, I was 32. It's, this is the worst thing a person can go through. This is the one worst thing our parent can go through. It's the worst thing our children can go through. I was allowed to have a goodbye visit with my daughter and all I can picture is this last visit and our last five minutes where my daughter started crying because I had to inform her that she was no longer going to get to see me. I had to inform her that I was no longer mom. And I had to inform her that I was going to continue to fight for her in any way I could. I think our system needs to be just like our criminal system. I think the family court should operate on a burden of proof. You need to have some kind of evidence. People can't just not like you and call and make an allegation and these people can walk into your home and take your children and you have the chance of never seeing them or touching them again. I do not think that it's easier to take my life away from me than it is to take that life away from a hardened criminal or a murderer. I do not think it's fair that it's easier for you to take my child or children from me based around allegations of sexual molestation when you can't even put somebody in prison for those same allegations because there isn't a burden of proof. I don't think our system is a just system. I think our system is a system that fulfills their own selfish needs and has very little focus on our kids. The very kids that they are supposed to care about and take care of and make sure that they're doing the best to uphold the integrity and not traumatize. I feel like they traumatize our children more than our children could ever be traumatized in the most worst case scenario. Thank you. It's time for our Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. Andrea Michelle Hagen a limited licensed master social worker, forensic interviewing is required, must be trained, must be videotaped. License ID is 680-1090984. She got her license February 10th of 2009. Andrea Hagen is a social worker who refuses to follow court orders. When picking Lori Scribner's grandchildren up, she put her arm around them and yelled, you don't love them. She told the children the gates of hell would open up wide if they were to live with Lori Scribner and have contact with any other family members. She told the children that she would get sued if they went to live with Grandma Lori. She seems to think the children's best interest is all about her, the way she believes 
and behaves leaves me to think she is indeed battling her own mental health demons. We did an investigation on her and it has revealed that she has been in an abusive relationship and has had her nose broken and the abuse allegation going back and forth between both partners. It is hard to believe Michigan would say they are protecting children when they give a person like her unfettered access to them. Andrea Hagen splitting this family apart, keeping these children from their grandmother. Shame on you, Andrea Hagen. You're on the Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. That's quite a story about Lori Scribner, and we're going to have to invite her back to the studio um, when she gets up back up here in Michigan uh, to update you folks on what has transpired in this grandmother's life trying to get her grandchildren after five years. She had gotten them, they, and um, they, they had moved back to Florida with her a week later, the att Attorney General of Michigan filed an appeal with the Supreme Court and Andrea Hagen, personally the social worker involved, went down to Florida and picked up these children and tore them out of the grandmother's life again. So we'll uh, update you when we get more updates. <music> We so searching, looking deep inside of every person, working extra hard, keep it certain. Energy to remedy the hurting. The poetry is what I'm dispersing, reversing all the negativity, animosity, never stopping me. So searching, flow beyond the people and the whole galaxy. And I want to thank you for watching today's program of Silent Voices No More. If you'd like to contact us, be a guest on our program, you can contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We also have a social network I'd like you to join, and that's at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Until next week, my friends, remember, your voice can make the difference.